<laughs> question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Balcom Hill. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and um, and I must say that it is galling of the worst degree to sit here and listen to us Labor Party MP give us on this side a lecture about finances and suggest that anything that we are, uh, we have not got a much higher record in providing economic stability uh, from this side of politics is, is extraordinary. I just need to, before I make my preliminary remarks, Mr Deputy Speaker, remind the previous speaker, remind the previous speaker that his side of politics, his side of politics gave us one million unemployed. Yeah, one million yeah, unemployed yeah, yeah, under point. his side of politics. So much for the party representing the working man. There were no working men <laughs> under their administration in the 1990s. But the one million unemployed weren't good enough. They had to really whack us harder with 17 per cent interest rates. If it wasn't one million unemployed giving us a hard time to manage um, the, uh, the nation's economic growth, it was the 17 per cent interest rates. And what did that give us? What did that give us? That gave us the recession we had to have. So before we sit here on our side and uh, be subject to the type of rhetoric that we've been receiving from Labor speakers over the course of this bill, let's just remind them that they have the uh, benefit of claiming the economic trifecta uh, in Australian politics of unemployment, high interest rates and a recession. But Mr Deputy Speaker, having been the Chair of the Joint Select Committee on the Parliamentary Budget Office, it gives me a great satisfaction to rise in support of this bill. I must say from the outset that I was very disappointed at the remarks of the Shadow Treasurer, the member for Maroubra, when he led for the opposition this morning. He's managed to surprise even me in how horribly misinformed he is about both the bill and the Joint Standing Committee's inquiry into the Parliamentary Budget Office. And I note none of the Labor MPs that were on that inquiry are in the chamber as we speak. I could not have agreed more with the member for Cronulla's reflection upon the member for Maroubra's speech. The Shadow Treasurer was indeed nothing but audacious. From his remarks this morning, the member for Maroubra, the so-called Shadow Treasurer, seems to be an avid enthusiast of conspiracy theories. I'm waiting for ET to come down. But let's just remember, oh, at the no. moment in Australia, we actually have 25% uh, of the population believe in UFOs. With, but with Labor's previous, with Labor's previous uh, polling, there's only 20% of the population that want to vote Labor. So we have 5% of the population <laughs> agree with the existence of the UFOs higher than those that are prepared to vote for the Labor Party. But, Regardless of these facts, we can always be certain that the Shadow Treasurer will wander into this place and cry foul without fully examining the true situation. The Shadow Treasurer seems unshakable in his belief that this bill forms the cornerstone of a grand conspiracy theory to deprive the people of New South Wales of open and transparent government. They should lecture us on open and transparent government. I think we just need to look at the New South Wales um, press gallery's coverage of ICAC at the moment to see what is the importance of open and transparent government. The shock value of this proposition coming from those opposite is awe-inspiring. The opposition must believe that the people of New South Wales had collective amnesia during their disastrous 16 years in government. Those opposite should be the last to lecture us about open and transparent government. Having been chair of the Joint Select Committee on the Parliamentary Budget Office, let me put the member for Maroubra's heart at rest. Both he and the Leader of the Opposition should be comforted by the realities of our inquiry. If only they had bothered to read the Committee's report before they cried wolf in this place, perhaps they would have saved themselves some embarrassment. Let me assure the House, in particular the Shadow Treasurer, that the Committee's inquiry was not completely superfluous as he described it this morning. The Shadow Treasurer should be more careful in future before he stands in this place and condemns the work of an entire committee as a waste of time. Such an attitude only illustrates his disdain, not only for the committee process itself, but also for the principle of transparent government in general, a principle that he professes to support. The committee's report was the result of a prolonged process of receiving submissions, engaging with relevant stakeholders, including political organisations, business groups, unions and international agencies. The committee also held a public hearing into the Parliamentary Budget Office. 
I note with interest the Shadow Treasurer's assertion this morning that the committee completely ignored the submission of former Acting Parliamentary Budget Officer and prominent public servant, servant Mr Tony Harris. This is horrendously inaccurate assertion. I would like to draw the attention of the member from Aruba to the committee's public inquiry where Mr Harris's evidence featured prominently. The committee worked well and I was proud to be involved in his del its deliberations. From my perspective, its inquiry and deliberations were far from superfluous, waste or a waste of time. Rather, to the contrary, it produced a well-considered and insightful report that I am very proud to support. I do not, however, I do note, however, that the behaviour of some members of the committee towards the committee staff was beyond embarrassing. The conduct of the Honourable Eric Rosendale of the other place, who apparently now is, a, uh, uh, is an independent, the Honourable Christina Keneally, who has um, uh, seen, uh, seen, light, seen a, a better light at the end of the tunnel and has departed this place, and the Honourable Walter Court was remarkably disrespectful. I think one of them was even chipped by the uh, uh, officers of the parliament for breaching parliamentary protocols. This was compounded only by the fact that these three individuals once held some sort of high office in this state. Members of this, this side of the House have no doubt noticed the inherent contradiction in the proposition of those opposite. They pop up one by one to say that this bill is some death nail to transparent government in this state. At the same time, they claim the committee's inquiry was a waste of time. Talk about hypocrisy. What a flimsy commitment to transparent government. Would they rather that the committee never had an inquiry? I know this is how they used to run this state, mm. ramming important legislation through this House without consultation. Mm. But one would have thought that they would have learnt something from the 26th of March 2011. If they really believed this bill to be so horrendous, surely they would support the committee inquiry and process. One of the most important results of the committee's inquiry was that there should be a parliamentary budget office. Every single submission supported the existence of a parliamentary budget office. Not one submission supported its ab ab abolition. Naturally, the committee's report supported this position as well. Unsurprisingly, this bill affirms the government's commitment to the existence of a parliamentary budget office. The ravings of those opposite seem to come from fantasy land. Again, they did not do their research because if they were, they would know that the existence of the parliamentary budget office is not in danger. The opposition's concerns are exaggerated and poorly informed. The committee was keen to see common ground from all stakeholders about how the promises made by political parties could be best costed, tested by a reliable and independent authority prior to a state election. This bill is that common ground. The protestations of those opposite merely represented a desire for taxpayer-funded largesse. The committee could find no evidence in support of an expensive style of parliamentary budget office that is apparently the deepest desire of the Labor Party. Listening to those opposite, one would be mistaken for thinking that we get absolutely no support in this place, that we have no staff and are completely left of our own devices without assistance. This is simply not the case. Already individual members of parliament have access to their own research staff, the parliamentary research service, their own party machines. Why should the government provide any special advice on how the state budgetary process works outside the existing options already available? If members of, op of the opposition don't understand the budgetary process, Mr Acting Speaker, they should go to TAFE. A permanent parliamentary budget office is simply unnecessary throughout an entire parliamentary term. Mr Acting Speaker, I've got better things to do with $10 million. This brings me to the most astounding of the member for Maroubra's assertions this morning, that we somehow need the Parliamentary Budget Office to educate members about the budget process. Surely the public expects members of Parliament to have some basic understanding about economics and budgets before they get here. Being a representative of the people is not a learn-on-the-job vocation. If you have no idea about what's going on, don't stand for Parliament. If you are so selfish that you stand, knowing that you are not adequately qualified, then the onus is upon you to fix your deficiencies yourself. In it, members of parliament should not depend on the taxpayer to teach them the basics of modern politics. This is a ridiculous position and a nanny state position that the opposition is obviously supportive of. 
I thank the government for accepting the committee's report and codifying our recommendations. This amendment will ensure the parliament will have access to an efficient and effective PBO and is capable of fulfilling its, four, its core um, functions. I commend the bill to the House. Mr. Speaker. Question 